Uh, good evening and welcome. Welcome to all of you who have joined this evening. I'm Don Kinsler, the NDSU Extension Agent for Cass County Horticulture. And it looks like we've got uh, just under 130 of you joining this evening. So thank you. I've really enjoyed these uh, weekly chats that we've had over the last uh, four weeks or so. It gives us a chance to talk gardening, and I've really enjoyed these. Uh, this is the fourth and last of the series that I call Everybody's Yard and Garden Guide series. And I plan to do a couple of these in the fall as well, kind of to get our yards and gardens ready for winter. Uh, but of course, right now, a uh, good time to talk about getting our yards, gardens, flower beds, lawns, and everything ready for spring. And of course, got a lot of snow on the ground, so we've got a ways to go before we can even see our lawns and gardens and flower beds. But now is the time to kind of get uh, thinking in our head what we need to do when the time does uh, allow. So again, thank you very much for all of you who are currently joining in. We're going to take a quick walk around the yard and garden uh, flower beds and we're going to pretend that it's spring and it's time to get going on some of these things. So uh, buckle up because we're going to go through the perennial garden, rose garden, shrubs, trees, fruit trees, lawns. We're going to talk a little bit about seed starting and uh, end up in the vegetable garden. Gosh, and just look, look at that photo of the tulips blooming and there's green grass and things happening. And after after this winter, isn't that going to be fun again? I am really looking forward to the smell of freshly mown grass and getting out into our own flower beds and yards. Uh, it seems like it's been a long winter and we're all ready for it. So let's get right into it. So let's start with spring in the perennial garden. Now the tops, uh, which are the above ground portion of perennials are best left on over winter because a couple of reasons for that. One is they survive winter better because the tops that are left on helps to catch snow and which is very good insulation. Uh, but also uh, there's beauty there. During the winter time, the Kind of the brown portions of a perennial garden do look attractive, but of course this year in our own perennial garden, uh, the snow is so deep I can't see a whole lot of it. But in a less snowy winter, uh, there's beauty to be had there. And so uh, they winter better. Uh, they actually look nice as they're poking up through the snow. But there's another reason for leaving the tops on, the above ground portions on over winter. And that's because Many of our pollinating bees do their nesting over winter in the hollow stems of these perennials. In the fall of the year, many of these little native bees enter into these woody stems and that's where they build their nest and survive the winter. Uh, so we are helping our pollinators by leaving those above ground portions on. And of course, the more pollinating bees we have, the better our, our apple crop will be. And we'll get more uh, cucumbers, more melons and everything else that's pollinated by these little bees. So in the spring of the year, after the snow all disappears, and about the time that there's a little bit of growth starting uh, at the base or, or before that, uh, it's time to cut them back. So most perennials arise from the ground again each spring. So that means we need to get rid of the old dead tops. Uh, if you didn't get rid of those old dead portions, the new growth has to push through too much, just too much old dead stuff. So including the ornamental grasses that you see pictured on the right hand side, those should all be cut down to just a little bit above ground level. And by the way, if, if you've got ornamental grasses and you haven't tried those gas or electric hedge trimmers or even a, a handheld hedge trimmers, they work really good for cutting back those old dead tops like that. So the key even with those ornamental grasses is to get them cut back before much growth starts. Otherwise, if a new growth starts in the middle of those ornamental grasses, when you go to cut back the dead stuff, uh, you tend to cut back the good green stuff too. So before the perennials get too large, that's the time. Now I mentioned the pollinating bees. Uh, here's a, a wonderful 
uh, article on pollinators, pollinating bees, a, a good uh, bulletin. And so if you simply do a search for uh, beautiful landscapes or a pollinator garden, NDSU, you'll come up with this. And it has some really good information about our pollinators that help us out. So now I mentioned that these pollinators uh, are, uh, these little bees are wintering in those dead tops. Now, depending on the year, when you go to cut back those perennial, the dead parts, there could still be pollinating bees in there that haven't woken up yet. And so it's important not to throw away those old dead tops out in the garbage uh, because you'd be disposing of your pollinators. Instead, if you take those dead tops and put them somewhere in your yard, maybe behind the garage or on top of the compost bin, but just kind of leave them there. At some point in, oh, at least May, late May, when the weather warms well, those little pollinating bees are going to be exiting and then it's safe to do something else with those tops. But see, a good way to help out our apple crops and everything else by caring for those little bees. So another thing in May, after the perennials start to kind of wake up a little bit and you see a little growth, uh, it's wise to fertilize. Perennials can be kind of heavy feeders, meaning they bloom better if they get good nutrition. So a couple of ways that we could fertilize those. One, of course, is the water soluble type that you could mix in a up in a bucket or watering can and pour those on. Or you can use the granular all-purpose type fertilizer, such as the 101010. And I'll always read, of course, the label uh, for the rate. Now, sometimes it's not always clear how much like of that granular fertilizer to use on perennials, but generally about a, a fourth of a cup or so around a well-established perennial is about right. There are um, one reason I like 10, 10, 10 is it can be used on vegetable gardens, flower gardens, uh, trees, shrubs, and there are different rates on the label for each of those different things. Now, of course, in the spring would be a really good time to get your soil tested if you haven't already, because uh, adding fertilizer, if you don't know what the soil test is, adding fertilizer is kind of like, and I love this, I, I didn't invent this saying, but I'm, I'm borrowing it, Adding fertilizer to untested soil is kind of like adding uh, salt to soup before you've tasted it. Uh, so you can get soil tests done at NDSU or University of Minnesota. So simply uh, search online NDSU soil testing and that will take you to the page to tell you how to take the test and also where to submit it. You can mail them in also. So spring is also a good time to uh, dig and divide any that are getting overcrowded. Uh, how do you know if a perennial should be divided? Um, well, a couple of ways to tell. If the center of the clump is dead and all the good growth is on the outer perimeter, then it should be dug and divided. Or maybe you want to share some with a neighbor or friend, uh, or maybe you want to move them around. Well, the spring is a good time to dig and divide about the time that you see a little bit of growth starting. Uh, you know, don't wait too long because, for example, this hosta that's being divided, if you wait till the leaves get full out, it's much more stressful for the plant. It's uh, less stressful if we divide them before they're fully expanded. And uh, let's see, well, how do we know which perennials to divide in the spring and which in the fall? Because maybe you've heard that certain ones like spring division, others divide in the fall. There's an easy way to tell. And that is by the bloom time. If a perennial blooms in spring or early summer, think of peonies or bleeding heart. Okay, bloom kind of in spring, May, early June. If they bloom in early summer or spring, the time to divide is in the fall, such as September is peony planting and dividing time. Uh, the reason for that is, is this. When a plant is in bloom or nearly going to bloom, that is its most tender time 
uh, it's more sensitive time and that's not the time to be digging, dividing and tearing it apart. So we dig and divide at the season of the time opposite its bloom time. So anything that blooms in early sp or spring, early summer, wait until fall. If it blooms in late summer, early fall, then it's fine to divide in spring. For example, hosta. If you think of when hosta are blooming, that's uh, sometime after the middle of summer. So that's why we're dividing those in the springtime. So kind of a handy way to remember which of the perennials should be dug and divided at a certain time of year. And of course, grassy weeds are always a problem in perennials if those grassy weeds get started, such as quackgrass. Uh, boy, because quack, quack grass can be such, such a nuisance in the middle of a peony clump or, or an iris, but we do have some remedies. There are herbicides that specifically kill only grasses. I know there are a couple of brand names. Uh, one of those is the high yield brand called Grass Killer. And another is the Ortho Grass Be Gone. And there's another one by the Bonide Company uh, called Grass Beater. Now, it's important to read the label directions, but these uh, grass killing herbicides specifically will kill only grasses. So you can spray them right over the top of a peony that's actively growing. Uh, you can even spray them over iris because iris is not a grass. Uh, you know, you might may kind of look somewhat like a grass, but but it's not in the grass family. But of course, ornamental grasses are a true grass, so we can't take quack grass out of those by using these because it would kill the good grass too. Uh, so we have some good, effective herbicides that can be used in those cases. Now, I found that they're they're slow acting. First of all, the quack grass has to have at least six inches or so on, and the label will, will tell you this, it has to have about six inches of fresh new growth. And uh, these chemicals uh, I found work slowly. So we have to have patience. You may not see any effect at all for a week or so. But in the spring of the year, when that quack grass starts growing up in the middle, it's a good time to apply these, uh, you know, probably in sometime the last half of May when the quack grass starts growing. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about roses. I should mention also uh, that as you have questions as we're moving along, if you uh, type those into the Q&A box there. So as you go along and we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, the, during our last uh, webinar on pruning, I think we spent about 45 minutes at the end. You don't have to tune in for the whole thing, but uh, we spent about 45 minutes at the end of the program uh, talking about questions. So anyway, feel free to type into the Q&A and I'll be checking those at the end. Let's talk about roses. Roses are always fun. They're a wonderful plant. Now, of course, there's different types of roses. The hybrid teas are winter tender. They do need protection. Uh, boy, and our roses this year are under about four feet of snow. So they're getting good, they're getting good winter insulation this year. Now, of course, there are types of roses that are termed on the label hardy, but of course, Hardy for Georgia is different than hardy for Fargo. And so we have to take some of that with a little bit of a grain of salt if some of these roses uh, call themselves hardy. Um, but my favorite type of roses are those developed in Canada because uh, they had a, a very great breeding program that developed some wonderfully winter hardy roses. Uh, some of our favorites, uh, boy, there's a beautiful one called Campfire. Uh, more, the Morden series, such as Morden Bell, uh, Morden Blush, Morden Sunrise. It's a beautiful orangey colored one. There are some that act like climbers, Henry Kelsey and William Baffin. And so if you do a little bit of searching uh, for Canadian shrub roses, some beautiful ones. Another one, Canadian Blooms. That's another great variety. Uh, so you could do a little checking, but you know, hybrid teas are well worth planting too, if you don't mind a little bit of work on protecting those for the winter. Now here's, here's something that I really enjoy on roses because um, well, let's talk a little bit about how roses are 
propagated or started. The um, kind of the traditional way of propagating a rose is to graft the variety, graft the good flowering variety onto a rootstock. That's a kind of a quick and easy way to propagate a rose, okay? The problem with that is, and there you see that pictured on the left-hand side. The problem with the grafted roses is that if that upper portion winter kills, uh, yet the roots remain alive, anything that grows from that is just kind of a, a nondescript rose. Uh, anytime it's happened to me, I've never seen them bloom. Uh, they weren't, the rootstock wasn't selected for blooming. It was just selected because they grow nice roots, I guess. But take a look at the photo on the right-hand side. I'm seeing more and more roses offered as, and look down at the bottom word there, own root, own root roses. Uh, instead of being grafted, these roses are started by cuttings or maybe tissue culture, but the entire rose from the top of the canes all the way down, including the roots, are all that good flowering variety. So even if the top winter kills a little bit in an open, very cold winter, even if the top dies back a little bit, anything that grows from the crown or the roots is going to be that good variety. So I was looking through a rose catalog just the other evening, and I'm happy to see that in the descriptions, some of these rose catalogs are saying grafted or own root. So when I buy a couple of roses, uh, rose bushes this year, I'm choosing the own root because they're just so much easier to deal with. And anything that grows from the base is going to be the good, good product. So spring care on roses. Well, after we uh, uncover any protection that we might have given them, such as rose cone or mounting leaves, uh, after we do that, oftentimes you'll see some winter dieback, which is common on roses. And if you take a look at the central picture there, any of the dead canes, the winter injured, will be brown. So it, it's fairly obvious what you need to cut out. The dead wood needs to be removed to allow the new fresh growth to occur. So the first step in pruning roses, and April is a, a good time. I don't know at what point in April this year uh, we'll be able to see the roses, but uh, usually in April is a good time to look and you'll see the winter injury, prune that out. And if you look at the diagram on the right-hand side, you'll see kind of a, a method for pruning roses. Now, roses respond very well to heavy pruning. And the reason for that is heavy pruning will stimulate nice, fresh, vigorous growth, and roses bloom better on that fresh, vigorous growth. So oftentimes you'll maybe cut a rose bush back by half at least, and then any kind of weak growth, uh, just remove that and leave the good, sturdy, healthy, uh, they'll be green colored canes and then the rose will bloom much better. Now, roses are heavy feeders. They love nutrition and they'll produce more blossoms as a result. So in the spring of the year, uh, late April, early May, good time to fertilize. You can use um, special rose fertilizer or a fertilizer for flowering type shrubs. 10-10-10 will work fine too, or a bucket of, um, of the water soluble type. Oh, and mulch, roses love mulch. Uh, roses don't care to be in rock mulch as much because roses kind of like it a little cooler. Now, they don't automatically die if they're in rock mulch, but rock mulch heats up so much in the summertime. And so rock mulch is less uh, rose friendly, but shredded bark or shredded wood product mulch is very rose friendly. It'll keep the soil more moist, which roses love. It will discourage weeds, but also keep the soil cooler, which roses also love. Okay, next we're gonna talk about shrubs. Now, if you were on last week's pruning seminar, uh, we talked about a little bit about pruning. So I'm, I'm going to go over this a little bit rapidly, but I wanna cover the key points too. So in shrubs, uh, I like to talk about the Annabelle hydrangea, which are the big white clusters of flowers, beautiful. Now, Annabelle hydrangea you, dies back each winter to somewhere maybe right at the base or maybe just six inches above ground level, but it, it generally dies back. So in the spring of the year, 
uh, before new growth starts. We can cut those back usually to four to six inches above ground level. And most of the new growth comes from that base. You could also almost cut them down even closer to the ground. So that's just the way Annabelle hydrangea does. Those we cut all the way back and to get rid of that old dead wood that will come. But there's another type of winter hardy hydrangea that is equally beautiful. They're called the panicle or paniculata hydrangeas. The blossoms are in a pyramidal or panicle type shape. Uh, I guess the one on the left hand there, isn't that beautiful? I believe that's the variety called um, vanilla strawberry. There are different varieties. Some have the white and pinkish tone. Some are almost entirely pink. Uh, some are white. Uh, some are even kind of a lime green. Well, anyway, the panicle type of hydrangeas act like what I would call a normal shrub. Uh, they don't freeze all the way back to the ground level like the Annabelle type. Instead, they leaf out from the above ground portions like uh, most of our landscape shrubs do. So in the spring of the year, uh, about all we have to do for pruning is to cut back the old uh, flower head uh, on those. Maybe trim them up, shape them up a little, remove some of the weak wood, and uh, then they're they're good to go. And of course, the spring is a good time to rejuvenate any shrubs that have gotten kind of uh, uh, overgrown. Maybe they're leggy, such as the dogwood here. Dogwood. Uh, branches get kind of woody. Um, they lose their nice red twigs and they get uh, kind of grayish like. And cutting them back in the spring of the year before they start new growth, cutting them all the way back like that to four to six inches, they'll send out fresh new growth from the base. And we can do that with potentilla shrubs, the yellow flowered. In fact, they love being trimmed back heavily. Uh, oh, about every three to four years. Otherwise, they get kind of woody and choked out. And lilacs uh, rejuvenate beautifully. Now, lilacs uh, won't usually bloom the summer in which they've been rejuvenated. If you just need to do a little bit of trimming on a lilac, it's probably better to wait until after they bloom, and then you can enjoy this year's flowering. I should mention, too, uh, spring is the time to prune shrubs. There's really not a good time. Uh, the fall is really not a good time to do pruning because it leaves uh, open wounds over winter time and you can get more branch die back. And so the spring uh, upcoming here, uh, April, is really a great month to do pruning and rejuvenation. Uh, so don't feel bad if you didn't do any trimming last fall. That's actually a good thing because the, sp the spring is the time. Uh, nine bark, the purple flowered, uh, purple leaved, that rejuvenates beautifully or a little trimming back. And the pink flowered spirea, they bloom so beautifully on fresh new growth. So giving them a nice prune back every so often in the spring really does well. And trees, we're going to cover this briefly because we did a whole session on pruning last time. But for anyone that missed, uh, pruning trees, most trees uh, would be pruned in April while well, they're still dormant before they start growth. And it's important to give trees um, their proper pruning cuts. Now, if you take a look at the photos on the left-hand side, notice that ridge where the side branch or twig meets the main uh, branch. Notice that ring in which the, uh, which the green arrows are pointing to. That ridge contains the healing tissue of that intersection. So if we prune too flush, we're cutting away those healing cells. So the proper pruning cut is just on the outside of that ridge. If you look at the lower left-hand photo, there's a pruning cut that has been made and that's proper. The arrow is pointing and it's been made just beyond that growth ridge, because what that will do then, that growth ridge will compartmentalize and seal off that pruning wound. It will kind of do the healing process. So then disease uh, and 
and uh, bacteria fungi won't be able to enter. Also, also I should mention um, pruning paints and sealers uh, are not recommended. A lot of research has been done on that and they've been shown to be counterproductive. The cells of the tree uh, need to do the healing and they do that better with just the uh, nature's fresh air. Okay, and in the springtime, after the snow is all melted and the weather warms up, that's the time to remove the tree guards for summer. They should be taken off because that would be a spot that insects or even mold could uh, accumulate. So it's better to take those off for the summertime and then replace again about November 1st. That will give the trunk uh, exposure to sunlight and uh, it's much better for the trunk. So off with the tree guards for the uh, spring and summertime. Let's talk really briefly about fruit trees. Uh, time to prune is basically before the buds swell. And we talked about this last week too, but we'll give just a quick little refresher course for those that maybe weren't on. Uh, apple trees are best pruned into a shape like a Christmas tree where the lower branches are wider out. And the reason for that is if the lower branches are wider out, uh, they will catch more sunlight more sunlight means more blossoming lower down on the tree. More blossoming means more fruit. You'll have more fruit within easy picking distance. If left to their own devices, apple trees become big and large and round and the flowers and fruit form up on the outer perimeter where the sunshine and fresh air is better. So if we get our trees into this pyramidal Christmas tree shape, it's just a lot easier and healthier on the tree. Now, if you've got a big old apple tree, it may take uh, you know four or five years of gradual trimming to get it into that shape. Now, there are other things, of course, too, that a person should prune on an apple tree. Any suckers that are rising down at the base of the tree should be removed. And the idea here is to just thin out the branches. Uh, go in and start cutting, thin them out so that more air and sunlight can get internally into the tree. You'll have less disease and also you'll get better flowering and fruiting in uh, kind of internally in the tree uh, and closer down so it's not up all on just the outside big uh, the outside big uh, perimeters. Also, the preferred height of a tree is taken down to about 12 feet. It just makes for easy picking. And if it's a big old tree, you may need to reduce it down gradually. It's usually recommended not to take more than about 25% of a tree's growth off at any one time. So um, the old saying, of course, is to be able to throw a football through the branches of an apple tree and not hit a branch. If a person is going to make any mistake in pruning, the mistake is usually not to remove enough. I love the old saying, uh, prune until it hurts and then prune some more. So thin, thin the apple tree out really, really good. Yeah, it works wonderfully. Now, I just wanted to talk briefly about raspberries because raspberries benefit greatly from pruning in April, but it's oftentimes not quite uh, evident what a person should be pruning. So I want to talk about those. Boy, and um, raspberries are a wonderful crop because in almost any of our backyards, there would be space for a few raspberries, uh, strawberries too, uh, but that's for another program. So anyway, let's take a look at raspberries. Uh, raspberries, of course, have a winter hardy root and crown from which the growth arises. But it's interesting, the canes or branches only live two growing seasons, okay? Which means after a second growing season, there's lots of dead in that raspberry patch. And that dead wood needs to be cut out, otherwise it crowds out the growth or it's gonna get disease also. So let's take a little closer look at, okay, in the spring of the year, what do we need to remove, okay? So here in this photo, this is about the middle of a summer. So if we take a look there at the middle of summer, the canes of the branches uh, that are the brown, brownish red, those are the ones that are currently producing the raspberry fruit. The greenish are the ones that are just growing that summer. And next year, the next growing season, they'll produce the fruit. Okay, so that means 
now uh, when we can see our raspberries again, we need to cut out the old dead canes. Those are the ones that bore fruit last year because they're not going to bear again. So you'll identify them by the old brown. Uh, sometimes they'll have kind of grayish old bark. And those need to be cut out down to ground level. And notice in that photo how we will leave the fresher green canes. So it's quite evident when you're actually in the raspberry patch. Oh yeah, I need to cut out these old dead brown canes. Oftentimes they'll be kind of crisp also and I'll leave the rest. And also for the raspberries to bear best, nice big fruits, it's important to leave only about three to six of the new healthy canes uh, per each foot of growth. Oh, and I want to mention honeyberry. Honeyberry is relatively new, relatively new, I suppose, what, over the last, last uh, I don't know, 12 years or so that they've become popular. Honeyberry, also called hascap, is a wonderful winter hardy fruit. They're delicious. Now, they're, the garden centers handle different types, and you do need two different cultivars in order to get fruit, but the locally owned garden centers uh, handle very nice varieties of these. Now the honeyberry is a kind of a woody shrub and again fully winter hardy so they're a decent landscape shrub as well. So a person could have a double duty shrub in the landscape, one that looks pretty good and also one that will bear fruit. Now depending on the cultivar, some grow four feet tall, some grow up to about seven feet and uh, they don't sucker, they don't become messy. So if you haven't tried uh, honeyberry, uh, give them a try. But again, you do need two different varieties to get fruiting. And aronia, similar, you know, you, you hear about aronia because the antioxidant level is so high. They're a healthy fruit, fully winter hardy. And look at the fall color down at the lower right hand. Aren't that pretty? They just become a brilliant, bright orange. And aronia berries, when they're fully ripe, I enjoy eating them even fresh out of hand, but they can be a little tart unless they're fully ripe. But gosh, uh, aronia, uh, wonderful juice, jellies. Uh, we include them in apple crisp as well. A wonderful fruit. Juneberry. Juneberries are making a resurgent. You know, it used to be in pioneer days, uh, most farmsteads would plant, um, uh, they would have asparagus, they'd have uh, rhubarb, they'd also plant juneberries because they're so winter hardy. These are the blueberry of the north. They're well adapted, they're, they're native to our areas. In Canada, they call them the Saskatoon or service berry. Now they make a very large shrub or a smallish tree. They can work well in a landscape too, where you might like a small kind of decorative type tree. And some of the varieties handled at garden centers have larger improved fruiting as well. Now you do have to battle the birds for these because the birds love them too, which usually means, and the, the birds know when they're ripe too. They they attack them kind of like the the afternoon before you're going to pick them. Uh, so bird netting is uh, probably the preferred way on those. But I just wanted to mention those because they're such a good, good, good shrub uh, or tree fruit. And plum. If you've never tried growing the plums that are winter hardy for our area, they are delicious. Uh, they have a sweetness that is just totally Awesome. Uh, well, anyway, here is a list of some of the varieties that you'd find at locally owned garden centers that do very well. And oh, there's a, a, a tree ripened plum is just mouthwatering. Uh, you'll see names like Toka, Pipestone, Alderman, La Crescent, Juanita, Pembina, Underwood, Black Ice, Mount Royal. Now, most of these do need two different types uh, for cross pollination is preferred. If you don't have room for two, well, plums don't grow into a big, huge tree. They, they're they smaller scale than apple trees. So most um, yards would probably have room for two, or maybe you and your neighbor can each get a plum tree, but make sure you get two different varieties. And some varieties are listed as good pollinators. So two different varieties. Okay, next we are gonna go into lawns and talk about some lawn care. Well, when to rake? Well, first of all, we got to get rid of the snow. Uh, but how do you know when it's time to rake? If we start too early when the grass is kind of wet and soggy, we can actually 
uproot some of the grass crowns, so that's not good. There's a fairly unscientific way, but it works, to know when it's time to rake a lawn, and that's to kneel on the lawn, and if your jeans get a wet spot, we need to wait until the lawn uh, dries up a little more. Well, what about also power raking? or dethatching it's called, which brings up all the fluff up out of the lawn and lays it on top and then it needs to be raked off or baked up. Um, and of course that needs to wait too until the grass is really good and firm and not wet. Otherwise it will really tear it up. So how do you know if your lawn needs power raking? Uh, now my wife Mary and I have never power raked ours. Uh, there's an easy way to check. Uh, the the reason for power raking or even raking period is to get rid of the thatch accumulation. Now the thatch, as the photo shows here, is that undecomposed layer of old grass clippings between the grass blades and the soil. Okay, now a certain amount of thatch is wonderful and necessary because the right amount of thatch will conserve moisture. It helps uh, control weeds and it keeps the soil cooler. So in the middle of summer, it won't dry out as much with the right amount of thatch. So what's the right amount of thatch? Well, if we cut a plug out of the soil profile and pull it on up, the right amount of thatch is about one half an inch. If it's greater than that, that thatch could be impeding the movement of water and air and nutrients down into the lawn. and so. If it's greater than a half an inch, then power raking would help. Now thatch decomposes naturally on its own. And as that thatch does decompose, it releases nutrients back down into the soil. So uh, power raking should maybe be done with caution as needed. And, but otherwise uh, no need to remove that thatch, which can be a valuable layer if it's not too deep. And of course, weed control. At a certain point in May, when the dandelions start blooming and the different lawn weeds come up, uh, when I say wise weed control, now most of our lawns are not a carpet of weeds. And so there's really usually not a reason to blanket the lawn with herbicides because most of our herbicides or weed killers are not preventatives. They're contact killers. They need to contact an actively growing weed. So if we blanket our lawn with a weed and feed or liquid, we're, we're probably wasting a great deal of money and chemicals that just end up in our uh, rivers and, and lakes and streams. So instead, since these products are contact, they need to be applied to actively growing weeds. And since many of our weeds just have a you know weed over there, one over there and one back there, it's oftentimes more beneficial or effective just to spot treat those weeds. Uh, it could just be with a simple hand uh, held bottle or a, I use a little two gallon pump type sprayer and just go along. And that way we can target just what we want to kill. And of course, in a lawn, there are very effective uh, called broadleaf we, uh, weed herbicides that uh, will not kill grass, but they'll take out these wider blade uh, non-grass weeds. And of course, I have a photo there of a dandelion weed killer. And of course, hand weeding, popping the weeds out is still very much a, a good way if, if the weeds aren't too, uh, too numerous. Now, what about grassy type weeds in a lawn? Well, now here, here you see a photo of crabgrass. Now, crabgrass is interesting. It, it's not a perennial grass. It doesn't come back from a winter hardy root. Each spring, it has to start from seed that it deposited the previous summer. And so uh, there are products that we can add uh, that will prevent that seed from sprouting. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But it's very important to, to determine which weedy grass is actually in your lawn. Uh, it's important to, to identify that what you've been troubled with is actually crabgrass. Sometimes the, the grass in the photo there with the pearly white roots, sometimes that's mistakenly nicknamed crabgrass. But this, this grass that I just showed there is quackgrass. Now quackgrass is 
a winter hardy perennial. If you take a look at the long runner rhizomes, uh, that's how it survives winter and that's how it spreads. So each year it will pop back up from that winter hardy root system. And uh, so the crabgrass preventers aren't going to work on quack grass. So it's important to kind of uh, know which one you're working with because there are crabgrass preventers that will prevent that seed from sprouting. Now it's important to get that cr uh, cr crabgrass preventer on at the right time before the little seedlings sprout. And the seedlings sprout in reaction to soil temperature. When the soil temperature start get, starts getting above about 50 degrees or approaching 50 degrees, that crabgrass seed can start to sprout. So the crabgrass preventers that are sold need to go down. And on the average, it's about tax day, April 15th. That's probably gonna be slower this year, later this year, just because of the conditions. There's a good way to tell what your soil temperature is. Well, you could use a soil thermometer. Uh, you could use a food thermometer if it goes down, uh, you know, below, you know, 60 degrees or so. It's got to measure about 50 degrees. Um, or you can check the NDAWN, N-D-A-W-N. That stands for North Dakota Agriculture Weather Network. If you just simply search NDAWN, soil temperature, it will come up with a chart with a lot of regional cities placed on. And then you can look at the nearest city and the chart says the soil temperature at two inches, four inches, all the way down to I think about eight feet down. So if you take a look at, at the surface soil temperature, you can monitor for your area when the soil temperatures are starting to approach 50 degrees, then that's the time to get the crabgrass preventer on. Now, if you put that preventer on too early, it can lose its effectiveness by the time that the crabgrass starts to sprout. So you don't want to get it on too early or too late. Well, what if we've got some hard to kill weeds such as thistles in the lawn or the creeping Charlie shown on the left? The fall is the preferred time, the best time to kill these weeds because that's the time when these weeds are carrying um, food down into the roots to survive winter and come back to haunt us the next year. So in the fall of the year, if we apply weed killer, it'll carry that down into the root and you get a better kill. But usually one application, such as in the fall, isn't going to totally control it because these are difficult to kill. So the secondary application is in the spring, in May, when they start growing. So now if you didn't get your application on last fall, go ahead and spray these, apply uh, the appropriate weed killer uh, to them in uh, May or early June, and then hit them again in the fall of the year. Because usually again, uh, one application in either spring or fall isn't gonna do it, but uh, twice a year, we can usually overcome them. Okay, now lawn fertilizer. We used to think that lawns should be fertilized right away, such as in April or early May to get them to green up. But that was kind of like force feeding before the lawns were ready to use it. And a lot of that fertilizer can just be washed away in spring rains. So a lot of lawn research has been done and it's shown that the optimum time in the spring to apply lawn fertilizer is around Memorial Day in May. That's the time when the lawn has already greened up and it's able to use the nutrition right away that we're going to apply. And another time, very important to apply lawn fertilizer is around Labor Day. In fact, if you were going to apply fertilizer once during the during the year, Labor Day is the preferred because uh, that's when the lawns are really rooting in really, really good for the next season. And, and then Memorial Day is secondary time. Seeding, if we've got any lawns, uh, lawn areas to repair. And, and gosh, the, uh, the last couple of years have been tough on lawns. Uh, they uh, just the dry season, the hot summers have been kind of tough on lawns. So any areas that need to be reseeded uh, can do that in May. The grass seed doesn't start to sprout until the soil temperature reaches about 50 degrees and above. So it doesn't pay to put it on too early. Otherwise, the birds uh, will, will have a good time with it. So maybe delay until the soil temperature is approaching 50. 
50. Now just quickly, we're gonna talk a little bit about starting seeds indoors. Had a whole webinar about this uh, a number of weeks ago, but just a little refresher for those that didn't uh, join that webinar. Starting seeds indoors. Um, now is a good time to start some things such as, well, peppers about March 15th. Petunias can start now, uh, marigolds pretty soon. Tomatoes grow so quickly from seeds, so they are delayed until about April 1st. So now um, just a couple of little points uh, that I always enjoy. And one is moistening down the seed starting mix and do use a special seed starting mix, but moisten that down well the day before, mix it around really good, and it'll be nice and mellow when you're going to use it. Otherwise, if you don't pre-moisten it, uh, it just is so dry and the seeds will float around. So uh, pre-moisten, and then after seeding, you still need to water the seed tray. Now, rather than direct seeding into the little cell packs, it's more efficient and effective to start the seeds in a seed tray and then transplant the little seedlings when they're big enough into your individual cell packs. That transports a, a vigor, a transplant vigor into the seedlings. You can duck them down a little cl uh, closer down into the soil so they're not as uh, whippy. And uh, this is a uh, kind of a cold frame that my wife and I use for growing our plants, our bedding plants. And uh, so we start them in the basement, grow them as long as we can. And when the, when the weather starts to moderate a little bit in April, the, this gives us a kind of a frost free spot to finish off the plants. And then you can raise uh, greenhouse quality bedding plants and tomato plants. Now a little bit about wintered plants, things that we brought indoors last fall, such as geraniums, uh, hibiscus, those are a favorite to bring in off the patio or deck and winter those. So in the spring of the year here, it's important to trim them back. Uh, these plants know that the days are getting longer. They sense the longer day length and uh, they'll start some new growth. And if we trim them back fairly heavily, they'll branch nicely from the base and you just get a much better plant from them. And we can begin fertilizing now. These plants sense the longer days, they're getting some growth spurt. And if we give them some nutrition now, March through September, that nutrition will help that new growth. So spring in the vegetable garden. Uh, that's actually a rototiller that I inherited from my dad. Uh, he bought it, I think when I was in junior high. Uh, I think, and the, so that rototiller is about 55 years old or, or so. And I enjoy it. Uh, I enjoy tilling. Uh, yes, for some parts in our vegetable garden, I am moving to a less tilling, but parts of it, I still give a spring tilling when the soil is workable. Uh, my wife and I enjoy large vegetable garden. Uh, I like all things. I like flowers. I like house plants. I like fruit trees and I love our vegetable garden as well. Now, one thing I wanted to mention in the vegetable garden is the use of clear plastic mulch on heat loving crops like melons. Uh, um, could you be used on cucumbers too, but uh, melons, both watermelon and musk melon have a hard time ripening during our season. But if we use clear plastic mulch, the clear plastic creates a greenhouse-like effect over the soil and the melons will ripen faster. Now, this was research that was done at NDSU in the 1960s and 70s as how to, how to grow melons in North Dakota so that farmers market growers could get melons for sale. So they did a lot of trial. Now you might think, well, wouldn't black plastic warm up better? And warm is the key. These uh, these melons like to think that they're in South Texas. They want warm soil. That gets them to grow really, really well. Okay, well, black plastic, you might think, it sounds like that would warm up more. And the surface does. But if you put your hand under black plastic on the soil, the soil is still cooler underneath. Whereas if you put your hand under clear plastic on the soil, that clear plastic has let the sunshine in and it creates a warm greenhouse 
over the soil and the plant roots love it. So another key in those is to start them early, watermelon, muskmelon, start them early about May 1st indoors. And then they're ready to transplant out when all danger of frost has passed, uh, maybe the last week or so in May. And then uh, we can get melons that grow just beautifully. Uh, this is one of our melons from watermelons from last year and just beautiful uh, homegrown fresh mouthwatering uh, is just wonderful. Ah, test time. Now don't panic and don't everybody jump off. There's only five questions to this test and I didn't do these on our last webinars but I do need to collect just some data and it's five easy questions and I'm going to try this. I need to uh, launch what's called a poll. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate you guys answering that. Okay. Now, uh, before we get to the question and answers, uh, I want to just mention a podcast that we've started. And when I say we, um, NDSU Extension, Cass County, and Forum Communications have started a joint venture on a gardening podcast. Forum reporter John Lamb, who's been with the Forum for a long, long time, a great reporter. And I do weekly conversations on podcasts. And so if you simply do a search uh, for wherever you get your podcasts, uh, Growing Together, a gardening podcast, you can listen to those. Uh, of course, they stay in an archive. And last week, we talked about um, Emerald Ash Borer and things that homeowners can do. And uh, so do, uh, do check those out if you get a chance. Okay, and I want to wish you guys a happy spring. And if you do have any questions, feel free to, uh, I mean, for the future, feel free to send me an email. And now uh, we're going to go into the question and answers. There's about 23 uh, questions. And uh, if any of you need to uh, jump off, you know, feel free to do so. But I want to thank you guys for joining. I've really enjoyed these uh, discussions that we've had. So anyway, thank you again for anybody that does need to leave. But um, if you'd like to listen to the questions, we'll continue those now. All right. What is the difference between 10, 10, 10 and 20, 20, 20? Can you just use half the amount? Yes, you can, because 10, 10, 10 would be half the strength of 20, 20, 20. And now 20, 20, 20 is kind of considered a kind of potent type fertilizer. And so you'd want to make sure you follow the label directions. Uh, and yeah, half would be right, half of what I mentioned. So instead of a quarter cup would be about an eighth. But again, consult the label because 20, 20, 20 could, you know, it's that's fairly potent. Uh, would hydrangeas be one to divide in the spring? Yes. Uh, the Annabelle hydrangea that all arises primarily from the lower part can be split and divided quite effectively. Um, Mary and I did that and, and created, I think, about four hydrangeas out of one. The paniculata type uh, that is less likely to all come from a multiple crown, those are a little more difficult to divide. But spring is definitely the time just as we're starting a little growth. Can you use the, use the grass killer on red raspberry plants in the garden? Yes. Yep. Uh, raspberries are listed on. Now check the label on the grass killer, um, but it's very effective. There may be a waiting time on that. Uh, between application and the time of harvest. But yep, it's very effective on both strawberries and raspberries, grass killing herbicides. Grass is invaded by lily of the valley. Can I use a grass killer in that? You absolutely can. Lily of the valley uh, is not a grass and uh, not in the grass family. So you can use that effectively on lily of the valley. Quack grass is taking over my yard. Any suggestions? Quack grass in a yard is problematic. Uh, the problem is that anything that will kill the quack grass is will also kill the good grass. Uh, we can be assured that the herbicide companies are trying to find something that would selectively remove that. Currently, there's not. So a couple of choices on quack grass in a lawn. Uh, you could use a, a an herbicide that kills all plants such as glyphosate which is the active ingredient in the original roundup 
that could be used to kill off. It'll kill off the lawn grass as well. And then you would reseed. Uh, you could smother it, such as with black plastic or cardboard, smother it. Uh, it takes a couple of months to kill probably. And then you would need to reseed. Now, quack grass is tricky because when the original part of the quack grass is, is killed, there are still kind of dormant buds down in the rhizomes that kick into action. So there will oftentimes be a second spurt of quack grass that you need to reapply uh, the, the uh, product to. We planted berries in a temporary garden last year. When is a good time to move them to their permanent spot? Uh, berries, either raspberries or strawberries, would be moved in uh, uh, late April, early May, just as maybe a little bit of growth is starting, but the spring is a good time, early spring, before they get much new growth on. Should fertilizer be put down around perennials before or after new mulch is added? Does it need to be mixed in with the soil or is sprinkling superficially okay? No, uh, it kind of depends on what type. That's, that's a great question. All these are great questions. Okay, if it's a water-soluble type fertilizer, so miracle Grow is probably the most popular brand that you'd mix up in a bucket. Those you, of course, just pour on and they quickly find their way down into the root system. So for some perennials uh, that we have wood mulch around, that can be a, an easy way to fertilize them. But the granular fertilizer is actually a little, probably a little easier to go and sprinkle around. You don't have to mix them up in water. But the granular type fertilizers have to find their way down into the roots. Now, find their way down in. They have to dissolve in water and get down into the roots, which means if you sprinkle them on the mulch, uh, they need to be, they need to dissolve and get down. You see, because roots drink in, so it has to be in a solution. So you, um, when, when I fertilize our perennials, which we have wood mulch on, when I fertilize them with granular, <laughs> excuse me, granular fertilizer, uh, I immediately water that in to dissolve the granules or apply it before we're going to get a spring rain. And that will help dissolve the granules down in. It's difficult. You could pull some of the mulch back and incorporate it into the soil. But the key there is you need to do something to get those granules into a solution. And of course, if they're incorporated into the soil, they dissolve into solution there. Does the campfire rose have its own root? Because as I mentioned, own root is preferable. It's sold both ways. So if it is own root, it will usually tell that. Or you can look down at the point where the canes, the branches meet the roots, and you can usually see a knobby graft. But most campfire roses that I've seen are on their own root, which is the preferred. So I think at most local owned garden centers, Larry, I think you'll probably find them on their own root, which means then anything comes from the base, even in a cold, cold winter is going to be campfire. Does Bleeding Heart prefer rock mulch or wood mulch? Definitely wood mulch. They'll grow in rock mulch, uh, but wood mulch is more uh, Bleeding Heart friendly. Bleeding Heart likes it cool. In fact, they'll keep their foliage longer into summer if it's cooler uh, so rock mulch where it tends to heat up more you'll get a quicker die back and of course bleeding heart tends to die back at some point in the middle of summer when should bridal respirea be cut back for rejuvenation on oh, bridal respirea blooms so much more prolifically on fresh growth so they they can be cut back should be cut back in early spring before you see much growth so the month of april at some point cut them back can be cut back all the way down to four to six inches and they'll uh, regrow nicely. They might not bloom the first year. I'd have to check on bridal wreath, uh, whether they bloom on new wood or old wood, um, probably old wood. So you may skip a season, but that's okay. It'll look uh, good for years and years and bloom well after. Okay, we have a lilac that's over 60 years old, massive, many of the branches are the size of my arm. We want to prune it, but worried because of the age and size of the branches. How heavily you light. Okay, to rejuvenate an old lilac, um, 
I first saw my parents doing that when I was a little boy. They had a very old lilac similar to what you described. They cut it all the way back to about six inches above ground level. And I was kind of shocked. It grew back beautifully and was beautiful for years to come. So uh, yeah, chainsaw, pruning saw would work fine. So do it before it starts growth in April. Uh, so cut it all the way back. That works on an old line like 99.9% .9 of the time. The only time it doesn't work is if the lilac hasn't been healthy or if in the last 60 years, if the trees have overtopped it and if now it's in dense shade. Lilacs love full sun or at least half day sun. So as long as it's still in full sun, I would definitely cut it back. Take before and after photos and send to me. That'd be awesome. How should we rejuvenate very old bridal wreath? Yep, cut it back early spring before it starts growth, uh, four to six inches above ground level. Works beautifully. What do you recommend for controlling weeds and flower beds? Have had very limited success with preen. Yep, I, I, I appreciate that. Preen, preen is a weed preventer and a weed preventer means that it only prevents weeds that pop up from seeds. And many of the weeds that come in our flower beds are perennial weeds like dandelions and different things coming back from a root. So preen can work. Um, that's a product sold in the uh, yellow and, and red uh, uh, containers. And um, so weed control in flower beds, preen accompanied with um, hand weeding. If it's uh, grass type weeds, then we could use the grass killers. But uh, weeds and flower beds uh, is, is a piece of work. Um, what and when to fertilize hydrangea plants? Uh, for hydrangea plants, uh, fertilize in the spring. That will help the summer blossoms. So fertilize uh, probably early May would be good. And with what to use? It could be an all-purpose uh, water-soluble type or 10, 10, 10. Or you, you could use a fertilizer that's tailored for uh, flowering shrubs. That's probably the preferred is one for flowering shrubs. It's tweaked a little bit uh, for flowering, but even an all-purpose type uh, would work well. We also planted asparagus in a temporary place. When is a good time to transplant it? Uh, transplant the asparagus uh, preferably while it's still dormant before, and they start growing kind of quickly. So as soon as the snow melts and the soil thaws enough for you to dig it, go ahead and move it just as soon as you can and early as you can. Uh, my uh, Minnesota Extension partner says to not over prune an apple tree and do it over three years. Otherwise over pruning in one year promotes sucker growth and reduces both. Yep, it's, uh, yeah, and I would certainly echo uh, my uh, a coworker over in Minnesota saying not to over prune. Yeah, there there's a limit. Uh, so I would agree. You know, especially if it's an older apple tree, especially do it over three. I, I think I mentioned even four to five years. Uh, otherwise, it's harder on a tree. Yep. So I certainly do echo his comments. Uh, yeah, don't don't do too much. I, I mentioned too, uh, not removing more than about 25%. That's kind of a good rule of thumb on whatever apple tree you're working on, don't take out over about 25%. Any thoughts on adding clover to lawns or replacing with clover? You know, in the 1940s and 1950s, uh, clover in lawns was considered a good thing. I remember our lawn at home had clover and it was kind of fun looking for a four leaf clover. Uh, clover is beneficial to a lawn because it fixes nitrogen down into the soil and it uh, plays well with lawn grass. We used to think that was a really good thing um, until uh, 2,4-D was invented somewhere in the 1940s. And then uh, weed killers on lawn started to eliminate the clover. So I'm all for adding clover. It's so deep rooted that it, uh, it stays green. And so clover lawns are becoming a thing again, uh, either entirely clover or mixing it in to lawn grass. And you can buy clover uh, called the white Dutch clover is the one to look for. I have a pretty large lilac tree right alongside my driveway. I want to trim it down because it hangs over the driveway. Uh, how do you suggest cutting it back? Okay, right alongside the driveway. Um, if it's if the lilac is hanging over 
the driveway. Uh, if you totally rejuvenated it, it might send up a bunch of growth that would be too close to the driveway. So you might have to remove what's hanging over, but then balance it on the opposite side so that you're kind of balancing the two sides. So I hope I answered that one okay. Feel free to send me a photo at my email address if you wanted to photograph that one and I could maybe help a little in more detail too. If I'm pruning back my indoor hibiscus, how much should I prune it back? 25%? Yeah, with an indoor hibiscus, yeah, about uh, yeah, a fourth to a third at least. It could go almost as much as a half pruned back on hibiscus. We can prune those more heavily than you would like an apple tree outside. Because hibiscus, geraniums, geraniums we cut back to just a couple inches above ground level, let them regrow nice. Pruning rhubarb, um, pruning rhubarb. Uh, maybe dividing rhubarb. Rhubarb comes of course from the lower crown from the ground level each year and that can be divided either in early spring just as it starts or September it can be divided uh, so if a rhubarb plant has become really large uh, and all the good stuff is on the outer perimeter it can be moved in early spring uh, just as a little bit of growth is starting is it possible to start a new garden bed from a spot in the lawn and get a good result the first season, or will it take a year or two? It is possible the first season. Uh, my wife and I, when we relocated, started a garden the first season. Um, now, there are a couple of ways. If it's currently in lawn, it's going to take a little bit of time, so your garden might be late. Uh, the first thing a person needs to do, of course, is get rid of the grass itself. You could rent a sod cutter and strip off the lawn, uh, or you could use a grass killing herbicide or something such as glyphosate roundup uh, now glyphosate generally uh, will not affect soil there's been a lot of research done on that generally uh, it's deactivated by soil so it uh, you can do your garden yet this uh, yet this summer uh, but again it would be late by the time you get the grass off unless you do the sod cutter the uh, lawn or the garden might have to wait until some point in June because even if you do use something a grass killer like glyphosate uh, it takes probably a couple of weeks to kill the grass and then you would need to rototill or strip off that dead grass um, so your best lawn is going to be the next year, but for sure work on it this year. You might be able to plant a later garden, middle June or so, and then next year you're really going to have a good lawn, or I mean a good garden. Thanks. Uh, when do you start tilling? Well, a good way to till tell whether your soil is ready to work up in the fall is to just take a uh, handful of it, give it a squeeze. If it stays in a clump, uh, then it's too wet yet. But if you give that uh, dirt ball a squeeze and if you can break it apart easily, then it's usually crumbly enough to start tilling. Uh, especially in our heavy clay soil, there's danger in going too early because it can make a lot of little mud balls. How do you treat for snow mold and other fungus in lawns? Uh, we can probably look forward to uh, a snow mold invasion because we've had snow for so long, it started early in December. And so snow mold, the best thing to do after the snow disappears, if you notice that grayish or pinkish material on the lawn, is to take a rake and rake it, fluff it up. The exposure to air will uh, usually get rid of it. Uh, there are fungicides that can be used, but usually they're not necessary. Uh, just kind of fluffing them up uh, will usually do the trick and the grass will start growing. You mentioned pruning pink spirea. Do you prune white spirea the same? Um, the pink spirea blooms on what is called new wood, the current season's growth. Uh, white spirea, the bridal wreath, blooms on uh, older wood. So um, you can prune them the same, but the bridal wreath, the white spirea, will probably delay until the next spring to bloom. But in the meantime, you've got a nicely rejuvenated shrub. Do you have a good reference uh, by book you would recommend? I do. Do an online search for a book series by a nonprofit organization. Uh, and uh, gosh, I keep 
uh, I keep the whole series uh, right here. It's called The Prairie Garden, The Prairie Garden. It's written in uh, Manitoba, uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba, a wonderful book series. So it's called The, the Prairie Garden Book Series. Uh, there are different things called The Prairie Garden, but look at The Prairie Garden um, Book Series, Winnipeg, Manitoba. And uh, they aren't overly expensive. They're a really, really good practical uh, book series on different topics for our growing area. Uh, will these uh, recordings be available on the website? Uh, it will take a while to get them uh, modified for recording, but yes, we do plan to do that. I have a long stretch of Lily Valley on the north side. I didn't get them cleaned up last fall. Can I pull them out or do I need to cut them off to not destroy that? Okay, the tops will be just kind of dry when the snow disappears. Well, they'll be wet and then they'll dry off and you can just rake away the old dead tops. Uh, usually they'll rake away okay. And if not, then you can cut them off. Uh, okay, so I ho hope that answered. Uh, how do you prune rhododendron shrubs? Ah, rhododendron are beautifully borderline in hardiness, but some of the those developed in Minnesota uh, have um, have merit for our area. They're the hardiest, and rhododendrons are best pruned after they're done blooming because they bloom so early. They already have their flower buds formed, and if we prune too early, we'd be cutting away this year's flower buds. So we wait until after the rhododendrons, azaleas are the same thing, until after they're done blooming uh, and they bloom early uh, uh, and then do pruning on them. And uh, yep, so right after blossoming. What is the best way to eradicate ground ivy? Ground ivy, another name for that is Creeping Charlie. Best way to eradicate is making sure that you apply a lawn weed killer the, uh, in the fall of the year, in September, a, the active ingredient called triclopyr, T-R-I-C-L-O-P-Y-R, triclopyr, is uh, one of the most effective. It doesn't kill grass, won't harm the grass, but uh, ground ivy, creeping charlie, uh, apply in the fall, but um, apply now in the spring too, and then again in the fall. Uh, I didn't mention whether that's in the lawn or in another landscaped area. Um, uh, so anyway, I hope, hope that answered it. Can I use the weed killer on uh, monograss? Uh, grass killer, is it part of the, it is part of the asparagus uh, family. Uh, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not totally sure what that, what that is, to be honest with you, monograss. Uh, part of the asparagus family. I'd have to do a little checking on that. If you wouldn't mind, if you're still on, if you could, if you could send me an email, because I'll probably lose your question here when we go off. I, I'd like to pursue that with you. Um, can I use the weed killer on monograss? So we'll find out uh, what weeds are active, actually growing, and uh, let's fine tune that. If you wouldn't mind emailing me at my email address. Uh, that'd be super. Thanks, Ann. Uh, okay, Aaron asks, any suggestions for out of control snow on the mountain? Uh, and if controlling it is out of the question, how do I keep it from browning in late summer? And of course, that's one reason people like to get rid of snow on the mountain is but uh, it's, it's a very vigorous ground cover with uh, white and green variegated leaves. Does well on the north side of homes, but it does tend to brown in late summer especially if it's in a hotter area. Okay, uh, you can try an all-purpose plant killer such as glyphosate, the active ingredient Roundup. You can try that. It probably won't uh, die all in one application. Um, uh, but also you could try smothering. Uh, smothering is becoming more popular. Uh, in place of some of the herbicides. So in smothering, you would cover with black plastic or cardboard weighted down. Uh, it would need to remain on for several months because the snow on the mountain would need to run out of all its energy underneath. And there could be a little regrowth, but you might try smothering. 
uh, or the herbicides. You might even try a broadleaf weed killer, a lawn weed killer with the active ingredient that I just mentioned called triclopyr. Triclopyr, T-R-I-clopyr. All right, starting a new lawn this spring, previous owners let it all go to weed. Planning to till it all and reseed. Any tips on timing? The problem with the weeds uh, that are active, that are currently there, chances are they are perennial weeds coming back from roots. So even if you till it uh, and seed lawn grass, those perennial type weeds are probably going to come up in your new lawn. So uh, what I would do would be to delay just a little bit. Uh, here's where patience, um, patience pays off. Let everything start growing in, in May and then apply uh, a product such as glyphosate um, to, to the lawn that will kill off both annual weeds that are spraying from seed, but also the perennial weeds and let all of that die and then till it up and reseed. Now that may mean you don't get to the reseeding until towards the end of May, but in the long run that will help. Otherwise you will probably be dealing with some of these, especially if there was quack grass in the lawn. If that's not dealt with before, you'll be trying to deal with it as it's growing in your lawn. What is a good tree to plant on a boulevard? Uh, Julie asks, um, hackberry? Uh, there are many good varieties of lindens. Uh, anything other than ash, because we know of the emerald ash borer uh, that's been found in the neighborhood. Um, so I mentioned hackberry, uh, uh, um, lindens, uh, oak trees, um, Ohio buckeye. NDSU has a good variety of both oak and some nice uh, um, Ohio Buckeye. Those would all be good choices for a boulevard tree. And depending on what city you're in, if you consult your uh, local forestry department, they will usually have trees that they want you to select from. How far back should a lilac uh, probably be pruned? Uh, lilacs, if you want to rejuvenate it, down to about four to six inches. When should you use a fertilizer that has more phosphorus? such as 10, 15, 10, Judy asks. And uh, the first number in a fertilizer uh, series, the first is nitrogen, which feeds the grassy part, the leafy part. Um, and the middle and the last numbers are more for root and flower growth. So a 10, 15, 10, would be more for either fruit production or flower production. So that's when you would use fertilizer that has more phosphorus when we're trying to encourage uh, roots and fruiting or flowering. What is the lifespan of sedum plants used along a sidewalk? Also, can they be split in the spring? They can be split in the spring just as new growth is starting. Lifespan of sedum plants, uh, they, should, uh, they should live uh, without a, a certain uh, death lifespan, um, but they do tend to get some older kind of growth that dies out and the newer, the, the good stuff is kind of on the outer perimeters. So you do oftentimes in spring need to dig and reset uh, the healthy plants and remove what is probably the older that is probably suffering dieback. Can you speak a bit about forcing branches for indoor flowering? When to cut? Ah, indoor um, flowering, such as uh, the yellow flowered uh, forsythia, um, the uh, rhododendrons and azaleas can be done, a pussy willow that can be done. And really just about the time that the branches are thinking about waking up. Uh, late winter, it's probably might not be too early to start now. Uh, spring isn't too far around the corner. And so you might try them now. You might delay just a little bit until those branches have had a little more mild temperatures. But uh, branches, uh, things that flower in the spring already have their flower buds set in those branches. So when the warm weather comes or you bring them indoors in a jar of water, those flower buds are already preformed. So they're sitting there waiting for you 
Uh, so before too long, you should be able to probably bring them in in force. Is there a blackberry variety that does well in North Dakota? Blackberries are certainly borderline in hardiness. Um, so if you do a little bit of an online search, because I'm not going to come up with a variety name for you, but if you do an online search, uh, blackberry variety, NDSU or University of Minnesota, you'll probably come up with the latest variety name that would be worth checking. But blackberry is definitely a borderline in winter hardiness for North Dakota and Minnesota. Can you use the grass killer around daylilies without harming? You sure can, because daylilies... Um, uh, daylilies are actually on the label of one or more of those grass killers because daylilies are not a grass. And so I've used them effectively and they are on the label of uh, at least one of those products. Uh, and you can check the labels online on those products as well. In Superior, Wisconsin, we have about six inches of ice on the ground under the snow. How will that affect the perennials and grass this year? Um, Ice, ice on top of those tends to be more smothering than just snow, which has snow has a little more air capacity. And so uh, on perennials and grass, sometimes the ice will tend to smother and mold what's underneath. So on the lawn, you could have more mold underneath that ice and possibly on perennials too. As soon as that uh as soon as the ice might be revealed under the snow, if there's anything you can do to break it up, that would probably be great. Start a new lawn on my boulevard. What is the best plan to prevent weeds reinvading the area? Um, there really aren't too many weed preventers for lawns, but as they appear, there are a lawn weed herbicides, so that would probably be the best bet. As, uh, as weeds appear, um, the grass type, um, such as quack grass, you probably won't be able to get out of there. But uh, uh, broadleaf weeds, there are products that you'll be able to use. Should the old mulch be removed from plants in the spring before you fertilize and add new mulch? Now, usually wood product mulch is left in place. It um, The lower surface that touches the soil will just decompose into good stuff. So you really don't need to remove old wood mulch. Uh, just let it decompose and add the new mulch right over the top. And as you're fertilizing, if it's a granular type, uh, maybe you remove a little bit of the mulch from around each perennial plant so that the fertilizer can get down next into the soil where it can dissolve and then pull the fertilizer or the uh, mulch back around. So anyway, uh, wood mulch usually left in place to decompose naturally, new added on top. Do roses that are graft ever, uh, that are coming from the root ever produce flowers again? Um, if the rose bush is all growing from the root, uh, I've never heard of them flowering. Um, if it is, it's a, an inferior type of flower. Um, maybe more related to a wild rose. Uh, and um, I've never experienced the rootstock producing flowers. Uh, have you used cocoa bean mulch? Cocoa bean mulch is a wonderful, wonderful product. Um, in addition to, or as an alternative to wood product mulch, cocoa bean mulch is awesome. There is a there there is a hesitation if you have pets in the yard. Uh, of course. Chocolate, cocoa, um, you know, not uh, not encouraged for pets to have access to chocolate or cocoa bean. But in the absence of pets in the yard, cocoa bean mulch is a great product. I have a little limelight hydrangea, seven years old, that I want to move. When and how should I do it? In the spring before it starts new growth. Uh, when shrubs are dormant is the less stressful time to move them and do a little bit of pruning back to compensate for the roots that will be lost. Is there a nice companion to bleeding heart to flower after the bleeding heart dies back? Uh, bleeding heart, yeah, you don't want anything that's going to overtake the bleeding heart. So a nice companion to the bleeding heart. Uh, well, you could put annual flowers uh, that would be planted in May. And by the time they kind of reach their their peak, the bleeding heart would probably be died, would died back. That's what I used to do. Uh, 
back home uh, in Lisbon, North Dakota, my mom, mom had a bleeding heart and I used to care for the flower beds and I would plant marigolds or petunias around the bleeding heart, which would take over. Uh, another perennial that would uh, be good around bleeding heart. Um, boy, I have to think about that one a little, but I think consider maybe annual flowers. Uh, what natural fertilizers do you recommend? Well, the fish emulsion is great. Um, really any of the organic type um, natural fertilizers, most any of them, uh, look at the analysis. Now, the wonderful thing about natural or organic type fertilizers is they're longer lasting. They're slower acting than the synthetic fertilizers. They're slower acting because uh, they have to kind of, uh, kind of mesh in more with the soil and be taken up. So they're usually slower acting, but longer lasting. So they definitely have some good benefits and some of them have soil building properties as well. So almost any of them, uh, you know, the rotted manure type bagged manure fertilizers work well. Uh, the seaweed, fish emulsion, all great products. I have a small greenhouse in my backyard. When is the right time to plant in there? Well, um, seeds could be started. They could be started indoors on a heat mat, or such as with fluorescent lights, or you could get them going in your little greenhouse. So the right time to plant in there depends on how you can keep it heated. You'll need to keep it uh, certainly above freezing. And so uh, depending on your heat source, if you can keep it really for plants going in there, you need to be able to keep it really above 60 uh, day and night. Of course, it'll heat up nice during the day in the sunshine, but it really shouldn't drop below 60 at night. So uh, whenever you can keep it above that, then you can start using it. I have several lilacs. One sends out a lot of suckers. What is the best way to contain or remove these? And of course, the old fashioned lilac uh, is known to uh, send up suckers. Um, uh, removal is pretty much with digging. Uh, the best way to contain, once you cut them down to ground level, try putting a um, like a landscape fabric if you don't currently have. A landscape fabric with a good heavy thick layer of mulch will at least slow them down. They'll still pop up in between between, you know, et cetera. But uh, suckers on lilacs, it is hard to contain those. I have a uh, hot lips turtle head. Yeah, nice perennials on the southeast corner of my house. Every summer it gets black specks on the leaves. Is it a fungus or too much heat? Uh, probably a, a fungus. Um, do mulch the soil with wood chips to keep it cooler because the turtle head perennial uh, doesn't like it overly hot, but it sounds like it probably is a fungus. So try an all-purpose uh, flower and vegetable fungicide applied before you typically start seeing those black spots on the leaves. When should you trim evergreen shrubs? Evergreen shrubs are usually pruned in May time, uh, about the time that they're starting to, starting to send up a little bit of growth. So evergreen shrubs are a little later pruning than we would do the leafy type. What is needed to treat peach and kiwi tree in and blueberries this spring to prevent bugs? Try the um, the insecticide called spinosad, S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D, spinosad, a wonderful, uh, fairly new, it's also an organic insecticide, uh, so that would be a good, a good product to investigate. How do I get rid of Virginia creeper vine? Virginia creeper, of course, is a very vigorous vine, and so there are a couple of things you can do. Um, mix up a bucket of um, herbicides such as glyphosate, mix up a bucket and then uh, bring the vines down. Once it's sent it up, send up uh, leaves, send out leaves, then uh, pull the vines down, at least some of them down into the bucket of glyphosate and do that in as many places as it is and get that, uh, get at least some of the leaves, as many leaves as possible on the vine to soak up some of that and uh, it, it'll take a little bit of persistence for that, but that would be a, a fairly useful method. How long do you have to wait after fertilizing in the spring to reseed the lawn? Uh, if you were totally going to reseed, uh, how long do you have to wait after fertilizing in the spring to reseed the lawn? 
Uh, there are fertilizers that can be that are, are mentioned for a seeding, uh, such as for new lawns. So investigate at the garden centers or even the national chains for a fertilizer. It's a lower analysis. It'll give the lawn its nutrition, but it won't be quite so hot that would burn a new seed. So check um, check the stores for uh, lawn fertilizer for newer lawns. Uh, it is available. So that, that would be a good product to use so you wouldn't have to delay reseeding the lawn. Should a bleeding heart be cut back in midsummer? After the bleeding heart has totally died back, so it's crisp brown, then it's safe to cut it back. Otherwise, it's still feeding the root system. Are coffee grounds good uh, mix in the plant soil? Coffee grounds work well. The acid, which actually our soils could use a little more acid because they're so alkaline, um, but most of the acid is already gone in the coffee that we drink. And the coffee grounds are a good organic material to mix into planting soil either house plants or outdoors. Is there a cheap light source for trying to grow seeds indoors? Uh, we use um, shop type fluorescent lights. Uh, they work beautifully. We, uh, LED lights work well, but uh, shop lights that, that hold two tubes, you can either get them in, you know, two foot, four feet, we use eight foot long shop type lights, work great. And keep the seeds only a couple inches below the fluorescent tubes. Okay, uh, let's see, we're almost to the end. How do you keep voles from the garden? Last question. Uh, can, I better check the chat box too. How do you keep voles from the garden? Can they climb wood legs if we raise the beds? Uh, voles uh, can't climb as much as house type mice, uh, but they will go at least six inches high because um, they've traveled up at least six inches on some of our raised beds. How do you keep voles from the garden? Um, you can use rodent type traps or rodent baits put in sections of PVC pipe. That'll keep them, uh, the, the uh, baits away, the poison away from kids or pets. So uh, by the raised beds, you might use that uh, sections of about 18 inches of PVC pipes with rodent bait tucked inside or um, yeah, because otherwise uh, you would have to raise it up probably, you know, 12 to 18 inches. Voles aren't real great climbers, but they can easily go six inches. Uh, let me quickly check uh, eight messages in the chat box. Um, what do we need to treat? Oh, okay, uh, I think we got those. The crabgrass killer. Um, crabgrass killer is under many different brand names. And most of the different brands uh, will just say simply crabgrass killer or crabgrass preventer. And so they're fairly clearly identified and they're different brand names. Uh, thank you for the kind words. Uh, Oh, well, you're very kind. Uh, the person said uh, the lecture made the day a bit better. Thank you for kind words. And I think we've covered all of the uh, the chats and questions. So thank you. Uh, thank you to the 60 of you who held right on into the end. And thank you very much. I appreciate these uh, the discussions that we've had. And thank you. I'll sign off very soon. And yeah, thank you and have a very, very good spring. You might also check, even though my series is done, uh, check out the spring fee NDSU's spring fever garden forums. I'm actually uh, one of the first speakers, which is this next Monday evening. So even though my own webinars are done, there are other good things happening. So check out the spring fever garden forums from NDSU. Thank you very much and have a very good uh, week and a very good spring. Thank you much. Mm -hmm.